Here we have a right and left clavicle and scapula. First we have the clavicle, we have the acromial end, that's this end near the acromion, and then here we have the sternal end near the sternum. We can tell this is right or this is a left clavicle because we have the acromial end over here and we have this bow right here that arches outwards towards the anterior side of the body. And you can see that here on this one where it's already attached. This is still the case. This is a right clavicle and scapula. And then here we have the scapula. The body of the scapula is the main mass of the scapula. Then we have some borders. We have the superior border, the medial border, the lateral border. We have the inferior angle at this point. We have here the glenoid cavity. This is where the head of the humerus sits. Then we have the coracoid process. That's this projection here. The acromion, this projection here. Then we have the scapular spine. That's this here. The subscapular fossa is on the underside or the anterior portion of the scapula. The infraspinous fossa below the spine is this right here. The supraspinous fossa here. And again, a fossa is a flattened space or a flattened region of bone. We can tell right versus left by orienting the scapular spine posteriorly and the glenoid cavity laterally. Again, this is a left. This is the upper arm bone or the humerus. This is the head of the humerus, the greater tubercle, the lesser tubercle. The anatomical neck is this that goes around the head of the humerus. The surgical neck is where you might expect the neck to be. We have the deltoid tuberosity, this rough section where the deltoid muscle attaches. On the distal end, we have the medial epicondyle, the lateral epicondyle, both of humerus, the capitulum right here, the trochlea of the humerus right here, and we have the olecranon fossa on the posterior side, on the anterior side we have the coronoid fossa and the radial fossa, and to tell right versus left we orient the head of the humerus medially and the olecranon fossa, fossa posteriorly. So if we orient that as such we can see that this is a right. Here we have a right and a left radius and ulna, this pair being the left pair. We'll put that to the side and we will look at the right pair. On the ulna, we have the olecranon process, we have the trochlear notch, we have the coronoid process, we have the radial notch, and we have the ulnar tuberosity. We also have the anterior border and the posterior border. And on the distal end, we have the styloid process of the ulna. And to tell right versus left, we position this posteriorly and this radial notch laterally. For the radius, we have the head of the radius, the neck of the radius, the radial tuberosity, styloid process of the radius, and the ulnar notch. That's where the ulna sits. And to orient this right and left, we have this radial tuberosity anterior and the styloid process lateral. Here we have the hand bones, we have the carpal bones, the metacarpal bones, and the phalanges. For the carpal bones, we have the scaphoid, the lunate, the triquetrum, the pisiform, the hamate, the capitate, the trapezoid, and the trapezium. And then here we have the metacarpals. We have metacarpal one, two, three, four, five, and then we have the proximal row, so we have proximal, metacarp or proximal phalanx of metacarpal 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, middle phalanx of metacarpal 2, 3, 4, 5, there's no middle phalanx here because there's only two bones, and then the distal phalanx of metacarpal 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Here are two models of the pelvis, we'll get back to those later. First we're going to be looking at this bone independently. This is a coxal bone. It has three regions. We have the ilium, the iliac region, the pubic region, and the ischial or ischium. Ischial region, the ischium. So iliac region, pubic region, ischial region. On the iliac region, we have the iliac crest up here, 
the anterior superior iliac spine, the anterior inferior iliac spine on the posterior side, the posterior superior iliac spine, posterior inferior iliac spine, and then we have the greater sciatic notch right here. We have the arcuate line coming right here. We have the iliac fossa right here. And we have the auricular surface of the ilium. And then we have the iliac tuberosity. On the ischium, we have the ischial spine. We have the lesser sciatic notch. We have the ischial tuberosity, this bumpy section down here. And we have the ischial ramus, which is this section here. And on the pubis, right here, we have the superior ramus of the pubis up top, the inferior ramus of pubis on bottom, and the pectineal line right here. It's a continuation of the arcuate line right here. And you can see the pectineal line and the arcuate line right here. They go around this center hole. With the pubis all together, we have the pubic symphysis, joining the two pubic regions together. On the side, we have the acetabulum. This is where the femoral head goes. We have the obturator foramen right here. We have the sacroiliac joint, which is where the sacrum and the ilium come together. And we can tell right versus left of the coxal bones by orienting these bumps here in the front, pubic region also in the front, this bumpy part in the back, and this side, or the iliac crest, laterally. Additionally, we have to identify male and female, and we can do that by looking at the angle of the pubic arch right here. The wider angle will be female, the smaller angle will be male. Additionally, we can try to put the fetal head through. It won't go through the male, but it will go through the female. Here we have the femur. At the proximal end, we have the head, the smooth, smooth section of the fovea capitis, where a femoral ligament goes. Here is the neck of the femur. And then we have the greater trochanter and the lesser trochanter. And on the back side, we have the linea aspera, this ridge. And then if we go to the distal end, it's easier to look on the posterior side. We have the medial epicondyle, the medial condyle, the lateral condyle, and the lateral epicondyle. These are all of the femur. In between the condyles, we have the intercondylar fossa. And then on the anterior side, we have the patellar surface. To tell right versus left, we position this medial, the femoral head medial, and these condyles posterior. So this is a right. Here we have the patella, or the kneecap. We have the base of the patella, the flat portion, the apex of the patella, the pointed portion. This is the proximal, distal end. And then on the underside, we have the medial facet, the lateral facet, and the vertical ridge. To tell right versus left, we position the lateral facet lateral, and it's a much larger facet we position the apex distally. We can also do this more easily by placing it on the table with the apex pointing away, whichever side it falls to, that's which one it is. So this is a right. Here we have two pairs of tibia and fibula, this being the right pair, put this aside. And first we're going to be talking about the tibia. So at the proximal end we have the medial condyle, and you can test that with the medial malleolus. You can see that they're on the same side. It's more prominent, the medial malleolus. And then we have the lateral condyle. And then in between those condyles, we have the intercondylar eminence. And then on the front, we have the tibial tuberosity and the anterior margin. And on the distal end, we have the medial malleolus again. And to tell right versus left, we put the tibial tuberosity anterior and the medial malleolus medial. So again, we can see that this is a left. And on this, we have the fibula. We have two terms we need to know. We have the head of the fibula. This is the proximal side. 
And then we have the distal side. This is the lateral malleolus. We don't have to know how to orient right and left, but it could be done using this ridge and understanding that the malleolus goes laterally. Here we have a foot. Back here we have the calcaneal bone or the calcaneus. We have the talus, the navicular bone, the cuboid. We have the lateral cuneiform, the intermediate cuneiform, and the medial cuneiform, medial side right here. And then we have metatarsals, metatarsals one, two, three, four, five. And then we have the proximal row of the metatarsals. So these are proximal phalanges. So proximal phalanx of metatarsal one, two, three, four, five. Then we have the middle row, middle phalanx of metatarsal two, three, four, five. No middle phalanx here. And then we have the distal row. We have distal phalanx of metatarsal one, two, three, four, five. We're going to talk about a couple kinds of joints. First, we have synarthroses, which are immovable joints, such as the sutures. We have the ampiarthroses, which are slightly movable joints, such as the pubic symphysis. And then we have diarthrotic joints, or synovial joints, and those are freely movable joints. There are six subcategories, first being the gliding or plane joint, and that allows movement across the surface, such as the intertarsal joints. And then we have the hinge joints, which are as they sound, they allow for movement like this, such as the elbow or the knee. And then we have pivot joints, which is, allows for rotational movement, such as the atlas and axis bones. Then we have ellipsoid joints, which are similar to ball and socket joints, but they're elongated on one axis, which minimizes movement. And then we have an example of that are wrist and knuckles. And then we have saddle joints, which allow for every motion except for rotation, for instance, the thumb. And then we have ball and socket joints, which is how it sounds. And these can be like the shoulder or the hip joints. Here we have a shoulder with a couple ligaments. Reminder that this is the scapula, humerus, and the clavicle, and these two projections are the acromion and the coracoid process. First we have the acromioclavicular ligament going from the acromion to the clavicle. Next we have the coracoacromial ligament which is going from the coracoid process to the acromion. And then we have the coracoclavicular ligament going from the coracoid to the clavicle. And it has two regions, the trapezoid ligament and the conoid ligament. Here we have an elbow joint. As a reminder, this is the ulna, the radius, and the humerus. Right here, on the radial side, we have the radial collateral ligament. On the ulnar side, we have the ulnar collateral ligament. And on the neck of the radius, we have the annular ligament. This ligament right here is not really a ligament, it's a tendon, and it's the tendon of the biceps brachii. Here we have the ligaments of the hip. First we have the iliofemoral ligament coming from the anterior inferior iliac spine branching like a Y shaped to the greater trochanter and the lesser trochanter. So this is the iliofemoral ligament and the pubofemoral ligament coming from the pubic region right there to the femur. Again this is a coxal bone and this is a femur. And then on the other side we have the ischiofemoral ligament coming from the ischium towards the greater trochanter. And if we look on another model, we can see the ligament of the femoral head coming from the fovea capitis. Here we have a knee joint. It's a reminder, this is the fibula, this is the tibia, and this is the femur. Remember that the, tibia, or the fibula is lateral. So starting with the meniscuses, we have the medial meniscus, the lateral meniscus, the quadriceps tendon, and then up here we have the tendon of the rectus femoris coming into the quadriceps tendon. Now here's the patella, and we have the patellar ligament. Ligaments are bone to bone, tendons are muscle to bone, or muscle to muscle. Then if we remove that right here, we have the anterior cruciate ligament, and if we flip to the back, we have the posterior cruciate ligament, and then on the tibial side, we have the tibial or medial collateral ligament. And on the fibular side, we have the fibular or lateral collateral ligament.